Oh, you both look great. I love the painting in the background. Oh, yeah. thank you. It's amazing. And when you see it in person, it's just even more moving, the details. Yeah, I can't wait to see it. I, I can tell it's huge. It's bigger than I expected. Larger than I expected. <laughs> I was about to say, it was bigger than Jeremy. <laughs> Put a hitch in my plans. I thought it was going to be easy to ship. It it wasn't, <laughs> but, uh, but that's that's part of the story and part of that <laughs> persistence and perseverance. So shall we just jump right into the conversation? Sure, ready when y'all are. Perfect. Well, I would love for you two to introduce yourselves. Okay, Katie, you first. Well, um, hi, my name is Katie Morlos Shannon. I'm a historian. I have my master's degree in history from LSU. Um, I got that in 2005, and I've been a professional historian ever since, working at various um, plantation historic sites, including Whitney Plantation in the early days, uh, Laura Plantation for many years. I did a um, exhibit on the enslaved community there, and now I'm at Evergreen Plantation, where created a database of over 400 enslaved individuals on the plantation and regularly write biographies of different people enslaved on the plantation. And I was just so honored when my cousin Jeremy asked me That's to true. this project. So actually, people are saying that your volume is a bit low. So could you? Oh, can you hear me now better? It's a little better. Okay. All right better now that's yeah perfect. okay i have to hold it closer do you want me to do that all again or what no 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 i think it's fine <laughs> okay, i think good. everyone heard it yeah <laughs> so take it away cousin jeremy okay well my name is jeremy i'm a historian a collector with special focus on portraiture um and um i think this is this is pretty exciting because this is a piece that i saw early on that uh was always on my mind and I'm happy to have been able to return it to Louisiana. Also, can you just mention like, you know, you both are historians and you realize that you're both distant cousins of each other. Right. So we're both from Louisiana, both have a, a very uh, long history with Louisiana as far as our families, my family, my African and European ancestors go back 300 years, my indigenous probably a little bit longer and we are cousins. And uh, that's just kind of how Louisiana is with early colonial settlers. Chances are you're going to be related and not three degrees of separation, but a little closer than that. Fair to say, Katie? Yes. Our family trees have an overlap um, with multiple names. Um, right. Jeremy, my, my mother's family and Jeremy's family all come from southwest Louisiana. And Katie, are you from Baton Rouge? Oh no, <laughs> <laughs> Baton Rouge. Baton Rouge is. Um, I went to school in Baton Rouge. I am a New Orleans native. Um, I have. Um, I live now in my hometown of Mandeville, just across the lake, and we have a little hobby farm with goats and chickens. But New Orleans is what I consider home. Gotcha. Well, we're all from Louisiana here. There you yeah. go. <laughs> we we'll all spent some time in Baton Rouge. Right. The Tigers. Go Tigers. Exactly. Um, so yeah, like, I mean, the focus of this conversation is the painting that's behind you, Jeremy. Um, and I would love for you to just to say, like, when did you first encounter this painting and how did you first encounter it? So the first time I saw this painting was in 2013. I think I was probably just doing um, a little bit of surfing on Google or whatever. And uh, at, the, at the time, I've become very interested in material culture. I wanted to see people, uh, specifically people of African descent, especially with this uh, Creole identity or culture. And so I began to collect images and look for images because they weren't in museums or not, not enough. <laughs> so I began to look. And I remember coming across this painting, and it was from an auction that had taken place three years earlier, 2010. And I said, whoa it really stopped me in my tracks i don't remember exactly where i was but i'm sure i was at some terrible corporate coffee house drinking a sugary <laughs> latte or something or something like that i guarantee it was something like that 
And I saw the painting and I was amazed. I, was, I do remember being fascinated by it. But what really fascinated me was that I quickly discovered that the painting, which had the figure that we would come to know as Bella's hair, had been uncovered then. But I saw the pre-conservation or pre-cleaning, pre-uncovering images that um, that were from an auction that was five years before the auction I was looking at. So in 2005, and um, I was equally shocked when I found out not only was this a Louisiana family, a Louisiana piece, Louisiana Creoles, but it was already in a museum. But the museum had sold it. Blew my mind. Um, in their notes they deemed it not relevant. Those are the exact quote. Not exactly. relevant to what their mission was at the time. Yeah. So we're not going to name any names in this conversation, but if you do your research, you can figure out oh. which institutions we're talking about. Okay. I didn't know we weren't naming names. Oh, we can. I, was just, I, I mean, I had a whole bag of tricks over here. I was just going to empty out. Uh, <laughs> No, you can find out pretty easily. It's a major one. We have some great institutions in Louisiana, and then we have some that uh, I think, you know, I think all institutions, especially museums right now, can uh, are learning and trying to catch up. And we, we are a little behind with some of our institutions. Let's leave that bad. That's our, fair. Our goal is not to vilify anyone, but to draw attention to times when opportunities were lost. Right. Where people could have done the right thing and unfortunately circumstances just led to things slipping through the cracks and so what our mission is is to make sure that doesn't happen again and when museums say well we don't have people of color or um it's difficult for us to show diversity on our walls let's make sure that when they have the opportunity to do so they take advantage of it and let's also acknowledge that it's it might be hard, but it's not as hard as the, as it has previously been thought. Right. Jeremy? No, that's absolutely true. And I think it's easy to make excuses. Um, uh, in this case, we know that there were several instances when uh, uh, some attention and a little bit of research should have been done. And uh, it's really negligence, in my opinion. It's, uh, really just un inexcusable. Um, but I made that pretty clear because I was on the accessions board of this museum. And uh, after dealing with them, even uh, in getting the files about this painting, I could no longer align myself with that museum. And, um, you know, I just couldn't. So. So someone watching their handle is don't drink paint water um, asked, <laughs> Was it deemed not relevant after the four figure was uncovered or before? So, so this was before. So the museum took all, well, well, well. But it, the figure had not been uncovered. However, they were aware that their multiple art experts had told them there was an, a hidden figure in the painting and the descendant herself who donated the painting said there was an enslaved person. Right. And it was the subject of a 1972 Times Picayune article that also mentioned there was an enslaved person. So what I what we found after looking at the files of the museum is virtually every mention of this painting, every single description mentions the covered figure in the back and it says large. Now this is a large painting. And the figure is significant, so it was it was pretty obvious. So they deemed it irrelevant or, or uh, no longer relevant to whatever their mission was. Um, but that's very confusing because that was in uh, the end of two thousand four. It would sell in February two thousand five. Also strange to me is the fact that they sold it in New York, out of region. So that's, they only sent two pieces. Now they deaccessioned, from what I understand, 140 pieces that year. I love to see that list. They wouldn't give it to me. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> yeah, but they, they sent two pieces to New York. And I find that very strange because 
why would you send a Louisiana piece to New York to be sold uh, when you, when one of the reasons they said they were getting rid of this is because they were going to allow other institutions to focus on Louisiana material culture. So it's kind of strange they sold it out of region, in my opinion. It is bizarre. So yeah, I wonder if you could tell a little bit of that history. So it was sold at a, a famed auction house. In the very famed one. <laughs> premier one. One of the premier ones. There's a couple of them. The one that's a household name, um, it sold for a significant amount of money, noth nothing uh, low, $7,000. And you may say, well, that's not too crazy for an auction house like that. Well, but the painting was unclean. Um, it had some ta uh, one tear and a few little uh, miscellaneous little issues, and it had no frame. So, you know, it's, it kind of it got quite a sum when you consider the, the so-called condition, um, which the museum says was in terrible condition, but uh, it only has one tear in the back. And we know that because it's been lined, and the lining is where you apply a, a, a support on the back of the canvas, and it's a clear lining. So we can really see the original canvas still, which is great. So it sold for $7,000 about to a dealer. Um, the dealer then decided to put in the investment and have the painting cleaned. It was cleaned in Virginia. And uh, he, con he then, cons and they uncovered the figure. They had no idea who any of the people were. And that's one of the strangest things I've talked to Katie about, is the family had no idea who their own people were, but did remember there was a covered up enslaved person. That's strange. So they didn't remember any of the children, but they did remember, oh, yeah, there is a cover up person underneath. So that person was uncovered. The person we would later learn was Belazaire. And it was consigned at an auction, but failed to sell. That just happens sometimes. This was in 2010. From then on, it was sold privately by the dealer. And that when something is sold privately, it could be anywhere. <laughs> so that's part of the. Uh, astonishing thing about being able to find it. And Jeremy was persistent and tenacious and just doggedly pursued this painting, hit obstacle after obstacle, True. and continued to try to find it because he was, felt so deeply that it belonged back in Louisiana and that we needed to know its story. So that yeah. just, we should all be very, very proud of that. Yeah. Thank you. I mean, I'm really inspired just hearing the story. I think historians need to like learn the lesson that sometimes if you're persistent and keep on asking questions and you annoy people, you can get answers. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Pol I always say politely pester. <laughs> and, and then when it gets not so polite, just give it a couple months and try again. Because that's the way you, I've been, I was after a painting one time, you know, for also for seven years. And and you just got to be polite and you just you have to try to to talk, reach out. And eventually, if it's meant to be, it will happen. The universe will make sure it happens. The ancestors will make sure it's happening. And uh, before you know it, you're doing an Instagram live and the paintings on your wall. <laughs> the same is true with historical research, really. You might hit brick walls at first. There have been people I've searched for for years and then eventually found. So it's dedication and perseverance. And in some ways, creativity. Yes. Uh, Jeremy employed a lot of creativity in how he approached people in order to get this painting. And research also involves creativity when it comes to looking for sources for people of color who may not be in your typical, you know, they're, you're not going to find a birth certificate per se, or uh, who've been missing from the established written narrative. You have to then think creatively about where else to search. <laughs> yeah, I, I think of you as like a undisciplined academic. Like, you know, I'm I'm a trained historian. I have a PhD, but the some of the methodologies that you employ, like we're not trained to do. But we should be. We all should be using these methodologies because that's how you get information. When I was in graduate school, yes, it was very um it was very abstract and, and philosophical and a lot of talk about historiography. And not a lot of, unfortunately, practical hands-on 
training in research. So when I came out of LSU, which I, I, it was a great program and I learned a lot. But when I came out, I, I had to figure out how to use the courthouses, the rural courthouses and parishes. And I had to teach myself how to search for things. And it takes years of that. But um, it's, it's important to be hands-on with the documents and to get to know the primary sources because that's what's really going to give you a story. And I find what really connects people to history is our, our paintings and stories and things that yeah. make people come alive. And you can only get that through really in-depth research. Right. Also, you both just talk to people. That's something we're not taught to do in grad school. Like you're That's supposed true. to like do a deep dive in the archive and like read documents and like delve into the historiography. But you all had conversations with people and that's one way in which you got information. So one of the biggest, and I have to give props to this person too, one of the biggest leads that I got um, on this painting was from a gentleman that I had talked to at the New York uh, uh, Antique Show. Uh, and of course, uh, Jonathan, we also had uh, talked and hung out in New York. And, and I had spoken to that person and at the show. He's an antique dealer. And... Um, and thankfully, thanks to Instagram, a platform that people should be using, institutions should be using, not just to uh, put pictures of people of color um, in front of things to show that your institution is diverse, but actually really engage and use it, ask public opinion. This is what people are using. This uh, very well may be the future of presentation or at least a version of this platform or platforms such as TikTok, Facebook and all this, right? So, uh, Instagram instrumental in you finding the painting? Yes. Yes. So someone reached out to me, um, a gentleman, and I'll just say his name. It's Taylor Thistleway, wonderful uh, antique collector. He's a younger fella. I say younger, meaning under 70. And that's <laughs> in the antique, in the antique world. And he's really under, he's like under 50 as well. He's about our age. I just don't want to, I don't want to out anybody's age over here, but I'm saying he's young. <laughs> he's younger than many people. And he said, Jeremy, I saw that painting 10 years ago or what, tw 10, 15 years ago. I said, what do you mean you saw it 15 years ago? Immediately. I said, Taylor, talk to me, talk to me. So we were able, he told me the shop. Uh, I was able to reach out to the dealer. Um, dealer ignored me a few, few times persistence persistence when he did answer you know he's like what do you that was like 20 years ago man you you want something i have on the wall right now no sir no sir i am looking for i'm looking for the painting but persistence you you tell people where you're coming from you communicate with them and i think a lot of times if you tell people why i'm after this he put me in touch with the owner i talked to the owner I told them why I was after this. This person didn't have to sell this painting. It wasn't a matter of finances, money. The reason was what I wanted to do. I wanted to get this painting here. I wanted to find out as much as I could about these people. When they found that out, they were open to that. That's amazing. And guess what? Taylor Thistleway picked up the painting for me, brought it, <laughs> and prepared it for shipping. This is a person I only met one time in person. So this just shows you that, you know, you can, you can connect with people. We can reach people over, over shared interests and over new lessons. It's a, I mean, this story is a story of many people coming together. And this is the story of a mission, of a calling, of something we have all recognized needs to be made right. And we'll, we are encountering people who are working together to do that. In this world where things can be so dark and bleak, it is wonderful to see that there are people who are passionate about making sure that there's redemption and justice. Yes. And there's also other people who are, want to stand in the way of progress. Um, and it's I don't think it's as malicious as, oh, they don't want Bella's air known. But it's they feel uncertain in their position. They feel uncomfortable. They are threatened by many different things. And so uh, they are very, very interested in keeping others where they are because they feel that they are too close 
for comfort. And uh, I think we can leave it at that. That's a nice way of saying That's a very Southern way of saying this. Huh? Well, I, I think you're right <laughs> about the painting being uncomfortable to a certain generation of people, frankly, to every generation of I would say most people in Louisiana up until oh, yeah. ours. Um, yes. Yes. Yeah, I agree with that. So I have to shout out someone who's currently watching right now. Her name is Serena Lee. She runs the Instagram account Georgian Diaspora. Oh yeah. I love that one. She's yeah. great. Awesome. Love Serena. Hi Serena. <laughs> <laughs> But she had a question, uh, um, okay. and maybe, um, Katie, you can jump in here. Um, but she had a question about Belazare, and she wanted to know about the, about the, the Frey family and if there's any information, um, about, you know, his enslavers and like what's sort of the backstory, the 19th century story behind this painting. So Belazare was born in 1822 in, um, uh, a, a little Creole cottage on St. Peter Street in um, the French Quarter in the household of a man named Joseph Trebino. That's an exclusive, by the way. (laughs) Oh, sorry. Was I supposed to do that? Yes. Yeah. We got to tell the story. Go ahead. Um, And and so Joseph Trebino was a Spanish merchant, Spanish sailor who had arrived in the Spanish colonial era to Louisiana. He, his name would later be creolized, more more frank, made into a francophile name of Trevine, and his son Paul Trevine would become a Creole activist. Joseph Trevino, while being Spanish, had relationships with two different free women of color, and they were um, part of his household. Sally Belazare's mother was the cook in the household. She had several other older children and gave birth to Belazare. While, live, while being owned by Joseph Trevino and living in his house. Now, Sally was an American. This indicates that she was not born in Louisiana. She was not Creole. She came from the Upper South and had been sold at the slave market in New Orleans. She, the, the farthest back we can trace her right now is 1815, when she was part of the household of Blaise Couche. Blaise Pouche was the colonial jailer. He was continued to be the jailer in the early American era. And he was, he was um, a brutal, rather cruel person, as one would have to be to be the jailer yeah. in colonial Louisiana. And he dealt a great deal with enslaved individuals who had committed crimes or run away. So his was not, I would imagine, a very easy household in which to live. Sally and her older children were sold first to, uh, well, they were sold to several other families before they were sold to Trevino. All of Sally's older children were considered Negroes or Negresses, meaning of full African ancestry. Only Belazare is listed as mulatto or of mixed racial ancestry, her youngest child. Joseph Trevino sold Belazar and Sally and his sister Rose together in 1820, late 1822, early 1823, to a free woman of color named Jeanette Levine. Um, they were, the children were sold with the mother, Rose and Belazar were sold with their mother because they were under the age of 10. And in Louisiana law, the ch- any ch- enslaved child under the age of 10 had to be sold with their mother. So then they became the property of Jeanette Levine. In 1828, she sold them to Frederick Fry. So Sally, the cook, um, then goes in and, and her young children, Belazar is now six years old, go into the Frederick Fry household. Frederick Fry was a merchant from Germany He was also the consul to the United States from Bremen and uh, sent to New Orleans. He would later become an important banker. For he was the head of Union Bank in New Orleans. um, Was very much involved in like speculation. um, Badly impacted by the Panic of 1837 and the financial crisis that occurred then. His wife was Corley Donwa. Courtly Donwa was from a very distinguished elite 
old Creole family who had been in New Orleans for generations. You may have heard of Dastrahan, Louisiana. That was one of his wife's ancestors, or, well, Diastrahan, the brother of John Noel, right? Yeah, that was her grandfather, I believe. So, so poorly Donwa married Frederick Fry. They owned a home in the French Quarter on Royal Street, where the Montleon Hotel is now located. And um, they were just very, very wealthy very wealthy um, and in, in elite circles. And that was um, Frederick Fry commissioned the painting in 1837 when Belazare was around 15 years old. His oldest children, Elizabeth, uh, Frederick and Leontine were also pictured in the painting. And what's incredibly tragic is that um, it, they did not live past the year which the, the daughters did not survived the year. They both died nine days apart at the end of 1837, December 1837, possibly um, from the yellow fever epidemic. The little boy, Frederick, he died at the age of 14, some years later. The only person pictured in the portrait who survived was Belazar. And he was six when he went into the Fry household. He is on ship manifests accompanying Frederick Fry on business trips. He was very close to the family, remained in the Fry household most of his adulthood. In 1841, Fry had, a, had accrued so many debts that he had to uh, appease his creditors by liquidating his assets. And so his property was auctioned off, including Sally and Belazare. And they were sold on the auction block at the St. Louis Hotel um, in, in the French Quarter, the giant rotunda. Um, there, it's a very iconic picture. They were sold there. Poorly, Donwa Fry bought them with her own money, which she could do because in Louisiana, women under the Napoleonic Code and civil law were allowed to have their own money and his creditors couldn't go after her. She bought them back, brought them back into the household. And it was not until 1856 that when he was around 34 years old, that he was sold, likely because um, Coralie was widowed and in very reduced economic circumstances, he was sold to Lezanne Becknell of Evergreen Plantation and brought out to St. John the Baptist Parish, a very rural community where he served in a household there as a domestic. So that's, that's his um, historical record. His story. And that would have been very different than how he grew up, considering he grew up in the French Quarter and for you know all of his life urban. So this would have been, I mean... Just imagine, you know, it, it, a major disruptor and something he would have definitely uh, had to adjust to. Um, even as an enslaved individual, there were, it's a new world to navigate. So, do you know if he served as an enslaved domestic or like a belt? Okay. He did. He's listed in 1856 in the family's papers under the um, domestics. So, I'm wondering if you could tell. A little bit of the the history between 1856 and let's say 2021. Like, how, how did <laughs> that's a lot to narrate? But like, how many times did it change hands? Um, wow. When was it donated to this institution, which name the name of which we probably would not say in this conversation? <laughs> okay, I'm gonna just leave out certain details because we are still doing research on exactly where and what happened to Belazare after 1856. Um, Katie is uh, following some leads and I think we we feel very confident we will we will find uh, what, we, what we're looking for. Um, but in regards to the painting, Miss Coralie Fry uh, died, I believe in when? 18, 1895. 1895. So since 1837, presumably, she kept this painting in her possession. Her possession, from uh, what I understand, it then passed to a family member uh, within um, the Pasture family, uh, related to the Pasture family, um, and would later descend, uh, sometime presumably shortly before it was donated, to a Miss Eugene Grasser. Eugene. Uh, what's that? No. You, oh, Mrs. Eugene Grasser. You using yes? The okay, sorry about yes. that. Audrey Grasser, right? Audrey, yeah. Right. So, um, 
and she would uh, she would donate this painting at the end of the year in 1971. And uh, the reason for donating it uh, was essentially she said it didn't really fit in her house. Um, it didn't fit in her son's lifestyle at the time. And I I spoke to the family. They were living on a houseboat. So, you know, I guess it didn't quite fit or maybe didn't go with the aesthetic. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so, uh, okay, well, what do you do? It, so they, they decided to donate it to an institution who uh, gladly took it, <laughs> as they, they seem to do. Um, but really unusual is one of two paintings donated. The other uh, is also by who I believe, you know, is by Giacomo and signed. I have really uh, come to believe this is by Giacomo and is attributed. Oh. So it's been previously attributed to Theodore Sidney Moyes and even Trevor Fowler. Both of these individuals work together. And I think it was attributed to these people mainly because they were known to have done a large scale painting with a background and this and that. And I, I'm not sure much scholarship, artistic scholarship was really used in that. And then later it was attributed to Franz Fleischbein, who I would have loved for it to be by because I love Franz Fleischbein. And Franz Fleischbein, who was a painter in New Orleans, painted more portraits of people of color than even artists of color, such as Julian Hudson. Now, he, Julian Hudson, of course, uh, apprenticed under Franz Fleischbein. Uh, so in, in any event, uh, but this is not by Franz Fleischbein. Um, I love Franz Fleischbein, but even in Franz Fleischbein's dreams, he couldn't paint this. <laughs> it, it just, it wouldn't happen. It just couldn't happen. Um, and so when we look at uh, style and we look at who was there, it beca became pretty clear to me that this was by Jacques Amon. And I think what threw off many scholars in the past was one that it was covered in old discolored varnish. Uh, the composition had been messed with. I mean, there was a boy completely covered over. Um, and honestly, really, it just hadn't been seen. We've seen pictures of it on our laptop, on our phone. But when you see that painting in person and you see the scale and you see the detail uh, for someone who collects, who has an interest in Louisiana portraiture, I think it's pretty clear. So in any event, they donate this uh, two paintings. One is a portrait of a lady, which we know where that is now, too. It's at the Historic New Orleans Collection. It is signed by Jacques Amon. For whatever reason, this institution misses the signature on that painting. Um, decides to sell it less than nine years later. Um, <laughs> and uh, they decide to keep this for about 30 years um, until they deem it uh, to be, what was the exact wording, Katie? I love the no, uh, not relevant. No longer relevant. No longer relevant. Wow. So they were moving on to a global perspective. Right. That's okay. what the lady said to me. She said, Jeremy, at the time we were worried about global interest and objects of a global interest. And I remind her, I said, well, you know, slavery occurred everywhere in the globe except for Antarctica. And that's because that's the only place where we don't have a permanent population. And sadly, continues to occur yes and yes good point katie continuing yeah. with you. No. right so that wasn't a good conversation and that was the day I, um i had to leave so you know i have a question about the composition and you just blew my mind by saying that it's probably by giacomo yes but why would a painter include an enslaved domestic in a portrait. Are there other examples of paintings like this? So, no, like, right. I'm going to let Katie say this. Oh, no. Uh, I'll say part and you say part. There are I'll examples of, there are quite a few paintings that you can find with enslaved people in them pictured with white European families. However, they are in a clearly subservient role they are um, very stereotyped in certain uh, postures and right. um, holding certain things that would indicate their status being less than and that were more like stock caricatures, not in the degree of um, this is as much a portrait of him, of Belazar, as it is of the three children. That was not the case with the others. Jeremy, would you like to add? Sure. So, uh, 
Belazare is represented as an individual. Um, and he's very much represented as a real person. We didn't know his name was Belazare, but now that we say his name is Belazare, we say, yeah, he's a Belazare because the artist presented uh, and took special care in presenting uh, something about him in this painting. And that is not typical in Louisiana. And it's not typical really in most American and even European paintings. We see uh, enslaved people where often I'm, wondering, is this a figurative work? Is this a prop or is this a real person? And even when they are a real person, like, oh, well, we know this person's name. They're doing the duty. So they're holding a child or uh, they're holding something or they're right. way out of frame as, as an anchor for the other piece. Belazare is the largest figure in this painting. Mm. And it forms a unique dialogue and your eye is drawn to him. And he does seem very comfortable in showing you a little bit of agitation. He's ready to do something else. What's he ready to do? Well, I always like to believe this because we have to be aware of this. One very important aspect about this painting, there's no enslavers in this painting. Hmm. All of these people are innocent. They are children. Okay? And they did not grow up to be enslavers. So uh, in that way, their innocence is preserved and uh, they all are in this situation. OK, in this, uh, you know, this disgusting situation under the umbrella of uh, institutionalized slavery. Um, but you're seeing a unique moment captured. Um, let's not let's not um, start smelling roses. Let's not talk about beautiful things. Start sipping mint juleps. Or, you know, have these ideas of, of whatever, uh, equality. No, uh, Belazare was not equal. Um, he was never equal. And uh, we, it, Katie has found instances where domestic uh, enslaved people were treated, you know, just there horrendously, horrendously. Uh, there is a myth that domestics received better treatment now. They might have received better physical treatment in terms of clothing and food and housing, but the psychological damage at play, yeah. the um, proximity to the white enslavers meant they were always, always um, on edge and having to think about every word and every movement. For women, there was the increased risk of rape and um, there was the psychological um, just difficulties of we love you we dote on you you're part of the family except we can sell you away at any time and if you slip up or do anything wrong we can beat you so i mean that's just a really really messed up in <laughs> yeah. your mind uh, how did he navigate the belazar is our playmate he, he's so special and look how smart belazar is and let's put him in the picture with all right, Bella, is there, you get out of line, you say the wrong thing, you do the wrong thing, you're going to be sold. RP. So there was no, life was not easier as an enslaved domestic. It was just right. different. And I, I wanted to say one last thing uh, about as far as composition uh, compared to other works. Often people speak of the portrait of Dido Bell hmm. and say, well, look, Dido Bell is portrayed as an equal. I've never seen that. I love the painting. I think it's a beautiful painting. I think the story is fascinating. But Dido is holding a tray. Right. And Dido is also scheming. Mm -hmm. And Dido is also exiting the frame. Mm -hmm. While her cousin is seen as a stable, should I say, very uh, postured and very sophisticated figure. me can you hear me oh, you, you, for a second you went out but now i hear you okay well uh so so uh her cousin is seen with the book and and seen this very sophisticated dido is exiting the scene and that kind of always bothered me and uh you know i i would be interested in knowing other people's interpretation uh of that but i never saw them as being equal in that, not to disparage that painting, but I think there is a difference.
Now, one thing I've heard is that, and I've even said this myself when I first encountered the painting, I assumed that they were half siblings. But I think, Katie, based on your research, it shows that they're not actually biologically related. We have nothing that would support that at this time. In fact, we have everything to show that it it, it was unlikely. Um, believe me, we looked for the link. We it's definitely was one of the first things that Jeremy and I both thought of. But at this time, we can find nothing that supports that. Um, that doesn't mean it's not possible. Right. There are, I mean, it is possible. There, there are many possibilities here, but it really doesn't look like that's the case. It looks like he was taken into their home as a very young boy, doted upon, um, cared about. He might must have been very precocious and intelligent, and um, they really cared about him. He was the children's playmate. He was close to Frederick. Um, and that is what it looks like, um, the, the reason why he was included. And I think Jeremy and I have both surmised that um, it's likely that the Pride children themselves had a great deal to do with his inclusion in the painting. Um, right. It, it and Katie, you not- have you have three children. I do. And, I- and she pointed out something that I thought was really like, aha, what did you say? If your children, or not your children, but children in general. I don't want to put myself in, but, but children. Right, should, exactly. <laughs> why isn't Belazare having to do this? I have to sit for this long all by myself. Right. Make mm-hmm. Belazare do it too. So that's one option. Or I'm not doing this. If Belazare doesn't do it, you got to make him do it too. I refuse to have my, my painting. This is boring. I want to go play. All right, we'll, we'll make Belazare do it too. But that's that sibling kind of overlap too. Well, hey, if I'm doing this, so and so do I have to do it too? And so you may have seen that overlap that we were kind of talking about uh, with these lines That's right. that the were defined. Of a household, and the inner workings of a household, of a family. And that's why the dynamics are so twisted and strange and, and just poignant and complex. Because right. he was a member of that family and that household. He was an intimate. And yet he could be sold away and harmed physically at any point. Right. And was sold. He was. And was sold. Right. Not liberated, not protected, not celebrated for years of servitude, but sold. That's something we got to remember. Because at the end of the day, they knew they had a dollar amount in their head. Yeah. They they were they were money in in their master's pockets. And it's a horrific, horrific thing. So someone asked, do we know exactly when? The portrait was overpainted. That's a hot subject and a hot topic. Uh, so we are taking steps to see if there's a forensic way of finding that out. Um, I have my suspicions um, because we were. I did some research on artists in uh, New Orleans in proximity to the family who were restoring paintings at the time. Um, because we have an idea of a time window when it was done and it was done a few decades after it was painted. I believe it was done. I don't want to say exactly. I want to just wait because I don't want to say the wrong thing, but yes, it was done many for many years. Belazare was there and then he wasn't. And then he reappeared over time. So that should be known. That, this painting in so many ways embodies the history of New Orleans and and New Orleans and Creole society and what was going on then and what went on later because after the civil well prior to the Civil War, while there was by no means equality, there was integration. People lived of of, their, of various races lived closely together, all amongst each other. There were various statuses, free and, and enslaved, and there were liminal um, in-between spaces, okay? And, and uh, there were nuances and complexity in relationships and in the color line. After the Civil War, with emancipation, white supremacists and, um, you know, the, the, the elite, the establishment decided there has to be a line drawn and it's black and white, and that's the way it's going to be. They, uh, after Reconstruction, after um, the Union um, 
the United States pulled out its troops and said, well, South, you're on your own. Uh, right. Sorry, we're done. Um, the ex-Confederates and their children took over. They made, uh, it became the Jim Crow South with segregated laws and um, Black people constantly living in fear of lynchings. And their spell is there now, covered up, because literally that painting becomes dangerous. It becomes right. a dangerous reminder and um, at, at, at its least very uncomfortable at its worst dangerous. And so this painting right. really just embodies the entire history of, of Louisiana. And there were all kinds of slander and libelous lawsuits filed uh, by New Orleans elite families claiming that other families had mixed blood. Um, so, you know, this would have been something, it could have been covered up as, as she said, uh, for many different reasons during different times in New Orleans history. Um, but it was certainly was a threat. And that's not to give a pass for them covering up Belazaire. No. Um, but uh, there, are, there are reasons why these things happen. The problem is he was kept covered up for way too long afterward. And there were opportunities and there were... Uh, I mean, if you look at these files, they could have found out who this was. I mean, they really could have. Now, they would have, they would have needed an expert. They would have needed a Katie, okay? They would have needed a Katie. And I don't know if she would have been available to the, this institution, but they would, have, they would have needed a Katie. But you could have found out uh, who it was because they had some very key information scribbled, the names of the family that we had to go digging for. They had Frederick Fry written on the document. I mean, come on. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, you know, I was pretty disgusted about the I'm still disgusted about but, it. But we did the homework. We went right. all the, and we have all the primary source documentation, which if we had just been handed a folder from them, we would not have had. So we did the groundwork. Oh, we have a better idea and understanding of and this wasn't all done on a computer. Katie went to these places, went to the archives, you know, COVID and all was, was digging through dusty. You know, she did it. She did go to these places. So well, that's what I love to do. Well, <laughs> so it wasn't too, too terrible. <laughs> what I'm, I'm astounded to find out that the information was right there in the archive. It's just that they didn't want, they weren't forthcoming with providing the files. So you had to well, go. Right. That's my opinion. I'll, I have to, I have to say that it's my opinion. Um, I will tell you this after I spoke to them about this and not to throw, when I became aware that this painting was available because originally I was just looking for a high resolution image. I just wanted to find out more. I didn't know if I'd be able to actually acquire this painting. Um, and when I found out it was for sale, I felt compelled to speak to this institution and say, hey, listen, there's an opportunity to get this back where it needs to be. I will step away from this. You know, I wasn't going to make any money. I wasn't doing it if y'all are interested. And uh, I'll fast forward. It is my honest opinion. And I know this, in my opinion, whatever fiber of my soul, uh, there was this was not a priority. Despite some lip service, oh, it's a lot of money. A lot of money, a lot of money, a lot of money. That's what they kept telling me. I've seen them spend, uh, spend this sort of money on the littlest of objects you wouldn't believe. I've seen them receive a $960,000 donation. This was $960,000. Okay. And uh, they, they were able to secure those. So um, I said, well, okay, this is going to end up in Louisiana and I'm going to get it. I'm putting it on my wall. That's what I was planning. With a mission. With a mission. I was planning on doing this, and I was going to tell you all about it, but fine, I'm going to get on my wall. They became very, very, very interested in having a conversation with me and trying to acquire it once I had it. I think they were hoping I wouldn't be able to get it. That's my opinion. And once I had it, I was a threat because I was going to be in control of the narrative. And that's been a reoccurring thing with people of color <laughs> and certain institutions that are, in my opinion, instruments of white supremacy. So that's all I could say. 
unconsciously and unknowingly, it's systemic, right? Built in, and it's right. Sometimes it's not even an. In, it, you can't even point to an individual. It's just the state of affairs of society of America of the way things. It, it, Katie, we won't get into specifics, but it's still happening. People are asking, uh, people are sending Katie emails asking about art and all sorts of things because <laughs> she's let's involved. It, let's get it straight. Jeremy, see, I'm pointing to him. It's this guy right here. He is the art expert. He knows about all the drawings and the paintings and the, the stuff. I, I do the history and the documentation, the primary source research. I'm paper with writing on it. He's drawings. I'm the art I'm the art guy, but they saw Katie and they said, no way this dude knows anything. Let me go reach out to her. But luckily we don't we're not worried about we don't that. Operate we operate like that. We <laughs> talked about this early on. We're like, we're not gonna allow the any of this to cause problems because that's not what we're here for. This isn't about ego. This nope. is about helping make things better. Right. Are we naming the museum or not? Nah? <laughs> <laughs> These comments. Um, no. Nah. It's really easy to find Google search right there in the newspaper. Y'all, I, I posted I posted my resignation on my story. <laughs> that was, there's no, I'm not being secretive about this. I just, you know, it's just not, it's not the forum. They, the villain, the villain, in my opinion, will be revealed. Well, the villain is bigger than any one institution, isn't it? It is, mm. though. It yeah. is, and we said that before. It's societal. It is yep. the, the sin that our country does not want. To, it's north, north and south. It's across the board. It's everywhere. This is a, a, an issue that until we confront head on, we'll continue. Uh oh, people are dropping clues. Look at that. <laughs> <laughs> well, maybe we can end on this question. Um, because I mean, there might be some museum professionals watching right now. And so what can we all do um to do better to make sure this doesn't happen again? Well, Katie, I'll let you start with that. Um and maybe I'll finish. I want you to, fi I want you to finish. Because I, I think that you could speak to this better than I. What I would say for me is recognize, just, just first of all, recognize the value and what you have. Do a little bit of the legwork and the research. It doesn't take as much as you might think. And find someone who can if, if, if you yourself don't know how. What I love about this is that Jeremy and I have, are experts in two different fields, and yet we came together to present a narrative and to discover this history together. It takes multiple, we're never going to understand slavery or, I mean, we'll never understand it, but, but have even the slightest glimmer of comprehension of it, unless we work together as historians and art, art experts and, and archeologists and folklorists, like all of the disciplines need to come together and work together in order to tell this story. And so it needs need not be, uh, you know, well, I'm an art, uh, I'm an art curator, curator, and that's what I do. I don't do history. We'll find someone who does would be what I would say. Now, Jeremy, you finish us off with the big bang insight. OK. Oh, no, that's too much. That's too much. Let me just say this. Let me I will I will say this. Um, we need to be all aware of our bias. Um, we all we all have been guilty of being dismissive against people that look like us who don't look like us against our own family members i mean let's just be honest yeah. so let's be aware of that and let's try to put that in check um you never know what somebody can bring to the table if you don't invite them over for dinner mm -hmm. okay um also i want to let you know just because you invite them over for dinner you need to make sure that you have a seat at the table mm -hmm. okay i never had a seat not, at the table it's not just a token seat and it's Thank not you. just <laughs> yes. to show Look who we have. It's right. real, meaningful conversation. You matter. Your story matters. Diversity matters. That's what we need. Right, exactly. Not a fold-up chair with a TV tray and a different <laughs> plastic. Because that's what I had. That's what I had at two institutions. They said I was invited. But, but, but the point is this. You never know what somebody can bring. And they don't have to have the budget to buy paintings they don't have to be a collector 
like I am, and they don't have to have a special life focus. Um, your duty, I think all of our duty is to try to see how we can connect with people and work together because you never know what can happen and what will happen when you try to do these unconventional things to make incredible things happen. And so I'll just say that and leave it. And also uh, to do shamelessly plug, but Katie has an important, important book coming up. Uh, again, Katie has been doing this sort of research before it was cool. I hate to say that, but it's very in vogue now. We know a lot of people are interested in the subject, especially marginalized people, people of African descent. She's been doing this for 20 plus years. So this is not something she just started. Uh, is that okay? That would be okay with you, Jonathan? I was doing this research when they were still wearing hoop skirts at Oak Alley, y'all. Yeah. High fructose corn syrup in their, uh, in yeah. their mint julep in the middle of a uh, sugar cane field. <laughs> But yeah, the book is called Antoine of Oak Alley. It's about the enslaved gardener uh, at Oak Alley, who was the first to propagate the pecan tree, which would lead to com the commercialization of the pecan industry. It's not only a bi biography of Antoine, but it's also a discussion of the community, the entire enslaved community, um, the world in which he made him and, and that he came from. And it's a celebration of a man's persistence and intelligence and um, just incredible ingenuity, even in the midst of this very brutal system. So thank you for letting me mention that because Antoine is very, just as Belazar is incredibly special to us, uh, so is Antoine. I would also encourage anyone watching to follow both of your Instagrams. You both are very active on um, social media and you share a lot of your research findings on social media. So please follow Jeremy. Please follow Katie because you just get more info. And also you can slide into their DMs, ask some questions. Like I, I have a lot more questions. <laughs> we could talk for another hour easily. We could. It would be fun. <laughs> <laughs> um, but unfortunately the um Instagram only gives us an hour to talk. Yeah. So <laughs> there we go. <laughs> well, I cannot thank you enough. It was delightful yeah. talking with you and um I'm hoping it's just our second conversation of many, many more um, for the many years. So thank you very much also for this opportunity and for continuing to do what you do. Um, and uh, I'm happy to be here and I hope we have a follow up conversation. Oh, oh we need to. Somebody mm -hmm. asked my handle. It's Katie, K-A-T-Y, Shannon, S-H-A-N-N-O-N, author, Katie Shannon, author. Okay. Well, I'm just inspired by both of you. Like, just like, I want to replicate your methodologies in my own research. So I've learned so much just from this conversation. So we have to do it again. Once you have more information about Belazare and into so them. Pray, pray okay. for us as we, we search for farther and, and, and look for it. So appreciate right. it. Okay. Well, thank you very much. Thank you. Best of luck in your research. And of course, it's a continued conversation, so we'll be in contact. Okay. Great. Take care. All right. Take care. Thank you. Bye, guys. Bye.